this is the uh, talking technique for business blogging. Um, just to give you a little be a background about myself, my name is Michael Johnson. I've been in the internet marketing space for about 13 years, and uh, I, I owned a digital agency, a marketing agency, for about 10 of those years. And I sold it a couple years ago, and I kept running into one problem as I was serving the small businesses over and over again, is that for search engine optimization to work or any type of content marketing strategy to work, a lot of, di a lot of it's based around a blog. And getting the business owner to actually create a blog post for you so you could go out there and do all the promotion that you would need to to drive them business and drive them traffic was like pulling eye teeth. It was, it was horrible. So I was having a simple conversation with somebody, trying to explain it to them uh, you know, in a million different ways. And it occurred to me at that moment that this was probably the easiest way to convey a message to somebody. It's to actually just have a conversation with somebody. And so that's kind of where I got the formation of the idea for the talking technique for the business blogging. And so I started looking into what really makes a, a great blog post. And I, I found a lot of things from a content perspective, but I also found a lot of things that people were talking about that were kind of, I, I consider more myths about blogging. So I, I would hear a lot of search engine optimization companies that would say, hey, you know, give me a blog post that's four or 500 words, okay? And then we'll just build a bunch of backlinks for that and, and, your, and your blog will kind of raise up and, and do all the things. So I, I, I found a bunch of different kind of myths like that that are around. And so I want to kind of show you some of the, some of the research that I found. Uh, now this is called the, what I call the content circle. And this is really uh, creating different versions of content for the same idea that you have. And uh, th this, is, this is the first part of that circle, which is at the top, which is, which is the audio component. Um, so when it comes to blogging, one of the research that I found, what there's, there's actually a direct correlation between the length of the blog post and how many links are coming back to it. Okay? And this is some research that was done by, uh, on SEO Moz, that's now Moz. And what they were finding is that the longer the blog post, the more links that were coming back. People would reference it over and over again. So there's a short of blog post that, uh, that, were, that was being recommended by different agencies that were out there, uh, not all of them, but by some of them, um, just really didn't have a big benefit for you as far as on the SEO standpoint, because back, uh, people linking to you is one of the biggest major factors for you to get rankings in the search engine. And if you write longer content that's relevant, that content then uh, can move up to the search. So that's one part. The other part is that there's, there's another guy named Neil, Neil Patel that runs a Quick Sprout blog. And he also found, when he started looking at all his blog posts that he does, is that the longer blog posts that he had on his site also were getting shared a lot more on social media. They were getting tweeted more, they were getting shared on Facebook more, and all the different other social, social uh, media platforms. So when you start looking at this, People like content that is more in-depth, that can actually teach you something and not just give you a general idea, just quick, you know, quick idea and then you're done. They wanted something that was more substantial and that's what they would share, not necessarily just look at and, and kind of go around their business. The other thing that, they, that I found in the research is that if you include a, a compelling image of sorts in there that's related to the story, then your share rate and your click-through rate just went up and 94% average. Uh, and this was specifically true for sports and news uh, type sites, but it works equally, as equally on the different uh, blogging platforms that, and the different topics that, that you use as well. So that was another factor. So the length was one factor, compelling images were another factor. Um, and then the other thing that I looked at also was there's, there's a company that's called um, Surf IQ, which is Search Engine Results Page. And they started doing research as well. And they were looking at uh, what was the average length of the content, written content, that was in the top 10 results uh, of the search engine pages, right? Because uh, if, you're, if your content, if your, your goal is to kind of get that message out there, then, then you need to kind of have an idea of what length of content people are looking for. And what they found, uh, or what's showing up so that they can find, people can find you. What they found was the average length was about 2,200 words that were going to be in the top 10. Now that's a big cry difference from that four or 500 words or even the 800 words or 1,000 words. 
But what does, that re- what does that really mean to you as a, as a person that's trying to write a blog? How many of you blog right now and your blog posts are less than 1,000 words? Right? Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, right? Because this strategy up here is talking about really going into the long tail. And if you're familiar with the long tail, Chris Anderson wrote that book a few years ago. And, and they're talking about being able to reach different types of content uh, or being able to reach a, a much larger audience uh, because of the content types that are out there. Uh, he gives some examples about Amazon having 10,000 products, each product selling you know, once a quarter, but Amazon collectively as a whole is, is going to be able to get out there and, and sell a lot of products. The same, same thing kind of applies on, on the blogging side. If your blog posts are longer, then as people do searches online, they're going to be able to find your, your blog posts about that topic. One thing that people don't realize is that when, when you look at um, the search engine results, Search in the keyword phrases, how people will find you online. How many of you think, what do you think about the unique phrases? How many searches on percentage wise do you think on a monthly basis are 100% unique, on, meaning that they only happen once? Just give me some numbers. Anybody? 20%. 20%. Good guess. It's higher. Anybody else? 30%. Okay, you guys are killing me here. It's not, it's not 30%, the answer is 50%. Okay, so, and this was research from a couple years ago, I'm sorry I didn't include that in here, but 50% of all searches done on a monthly basis are 100% unique. Why on earth would I optimize for a term that it only happens once a month? You wouldn't. So the, the other answer to that is you would create longer content so you have a better opportunity to actually show up in the search, okay? So when you're, when you're talking about this long blogging process, if you're trying to create blog posts that are 1,000 words, 2,000 words, you know, these, are longer, these are longer blog posts. This takes a while to do. This is kind of the general process that you have to go through and outline, right? You're going to have to research the topic because if you're going to talk that long on something or write about something that long, you're going to have to have a little bit of knowledge on that. Even if you've been working in that space for you know, 15 or 20 years, to sp- to, to write about that topic, you want to kind of limit what you're going to be talking about a little bit and not keep it too broad. You want to kind of be specific, which means you need more information. So then you have to kind of sit down and organize your thoughts, right? Ty- type it all up. I'm just guessing that most of the people in here are, are pretty proficient at typing, all right? Uh, my wife is a transcriptionist, and she types much faster than I do, but uh, I have some people... Uh, do you mind if I pick you out here, Joe? Okay, I'm going to point out Joe because I, I know for a fact that he's more like the hunt and peck type of thing. <laughs> All right? If you're talking to him and say, hey, can you type 2,000 words for me? You might be here the rest of the afternoon and sometime tomorrow too. Okay, it's going to happen slowly. Then you have to go back and edit your stuff probably several times, right? Uh, then you're going to optimize it for the search engines. So people can find you. You're doing all this work. Might as well take a little bit of extra time and optimize it. Then you're going to try and find a compelling image in there and put that in there. And then finally, you'll schedule that post so it goes out. When you're doing this whole process, what I found when, I, when I'm going to doing this and creating this for clients and for myself, this whole process can take anywhere from eight hours to 20 hours. That's a long process. So what are you doing the rest of your work week, right? If, if, you, if you listen to some of the, the blogging you know, experts that are out there and they're telling you to blog every single day, come on, eight hours to create one blog post that's this significant lace, uh, length to give you the enough time to actually get out there and do stuff, that's all you're doing. And if you're a professional blogger, that's one thing, but if you actually have a business to run, that's something else, right? So this is what I found is when I, when I split the line here and said, what's the important stuff here? It's not all the technical uh, jargon that I need to do. It's not the typing and the editing. It's not the optimization or finding the images. It's my knowledge that's important as a business owner. I need a way to easily convey that to my prospect. Okay? So I said as I do that, research it, organize your thoughts, and then have a conversation. Have a conversation with your ideal client right in front of you and explain to them what it is that you're trying to do. I mean, think about it this way. If you were trying to have uh, if you were trying to have your, your perfect client sitting in front of you and you were trying to ask them or convince them about a topic that you were talking about, that you're the expert in that field, 
would you rather sit down there and type it or would you rather have a conversation with that person? So now I'm saying, even if that conversation is just with yourself in your head, okay, it's a much more, uh, it's much more natural progression when it comes to this conversation because this is a natural way of communicating. It's not, it's not the written word, it will, all, although the written word is, is something that we use to, to take our, our messaging and get it out there because you can't have conversations realistically with everybody. But in today's world, you can, as long as you use some of the other tools that are available. So here's, here's how you build a message that is going to resonate with a lot of people, okay? What, because what I find is that when you're trying to organize your thoughts and, and get them out into the world, this process of going through and recording what you're going to be typing instead of going out there and typing it is kind of a, a, a stumbling block for some people, right? So you need a way to kind of have that conversation with yourself and put that out there. So what I say is build a message map. How many are familiar with a message map? Anybody? Okay. So um, essentially what this process is, if you're trying to get a consistent message across a really large organization, you have to come up with a really simple way of doing it. Have you ever played that game when you were a kid that at, at one end of the spectrum, you started and you whispered in somebody's ear what that message was? Then the person would turn around and say, okay, here it is. And then they'd turn around again and say, here it is. By the time it got to the end of the line, those messages generally were completely different. Right? It wasn't even, it was, com it was really comical on how, how vastly different those messages were. So you needed to come up with a way that you can actually convey this. And it, oddly enough, when you're doing this blogging, and whether you're going to uh, use a talking technique on this or actually just write about it, this process has helped me with speeches. I've given speeches doing this. I do, my, I do my presentations this way, and I do all my blogging this way as well. So what you want to do is you want to start with kind of a general subject. Okay? So the general subject that you want to talk about it doesn't really matter. The thing is, since you're, the, since you're the expert on the field, you should know what your customer is talking about because you're going to be hearing complaints coming back from them, right? So maybe that's, maybe that's going to be a good topic of conversation. Uh, you're you're going to be hearing about the, the shiny, shiny, shiny object that's out there right now. So maybe you can address that within, within your topic of conversation. Uh, whatever, the, whatever those problems or issues are, you're going to be able to uh, deal with those in a more in-depth way, okay? So you want to pick kind of a big, uh, I say story subject, and I'll get to that in a minute, that you're going to be speaking about within your blog post. The next thing you want to do is you want to get three to five bullet points that support that main topic. And I say bullet points because you're, you're going to go out there and fill that in later on. But you only want to keep it very, very simple. So what is the core message that you need to go out there and get somebody to understand if all they did was read, read your blog post, you want these bullet points to be what their takeaways are, okay? So that's kind of what you want to keep in mind there. And I say th three to five because realistically in, in that time frame, you're only going to be able to get, uh, in, in those 2,000 words, you're only going to be able to effectively communicate maybe three to five different bullet points, okay? So you don't want to really get more than that. Uh, the next thing you want to do there is get third-party references. Go out there and find somebody else validating what you're saying. Now, it's, it's great that you're the knowledge and you're the expert on the field, okay? But if you don't have somebody else backing you up, it's just you talking. And it's, it's one of those things that at, at, in, in marketing we have what they call the rule of three, okay? If in a short time frame, somebody sees your messaging in three different spots, one, they'll say, hey, yes, that's neat. Two, they say, oh, what a coincidence. Three, they say that's a pattern and it sticks. And it starts to stick from that point. All right, so if you can reference your material in several different ways, from, from third party validation to research, then you'll be able to kind of get, get that messaging across in a way that they will understand and they, they just are going to have to uh, look at you, what you're saying, as you're the expert in that because you're saying it, and then you have this other guy that's backing you up, and you have this other source over here that's backing you up. So I try and use other experts. I try and use uh, publications that are out there, anything that's in print, magazine, uh, any research material that's out there. And it really doesn't have, uh, you, you want to keep it as credible as possible, but sometimes it doesn't need to be, depending on your, your subject matter that you're talking about. Does that make sense to everybody? And I have, a, I have a habit of like speeding through this stuff, so I'm going to try and slow down a little bit. But 
So the other thing is uh, to use uh, story archetypes uh, to convey your message. Uh, communication is all about storytelling. It's all about uh, trying to get, your, get you out of that situation and allow, uh, allow your perfect prospect, your perfect customer, to be able to insert them into th themselves into that story. If your story doesn't have a way for them to do that, then it's going to be more difficult for them to connect with you and buy your product or service. All right, so I'll go over the different story archetypes here in, in, in just a minute. But uh, th think about it this way. When, when you think about different experiences that have happened in your life, do you think about them in different bullet points or do you think about them in a story? Whenever you sit around and, and you're having that conversation with somebody on the weekend or at the bar or at the restaurant, do you tell them in a story format or you just give them the highlights? Okay, so you wanna kind of, you wanna bring it to them again in that story. So here's the different story archetypes that, that are out there. There are seven main ones and you can mix and match these. Okay, so you're not, you're not gonna have to be pigeonholed into any single one of them. In fact, many of the best story archetypes that are out there or, or best stories that are out there have several of the archetypes built into them. Um, so the first one, for example, overcoming the monster. Now this can be a literal monster or it could be a figurative, figurative one. Um, stories like this are, would be something like David and Goliath, right? That's uh, a little guy doing a really big guy. That's, that's kind of a scary situation. Um, so that, that could be an example of that. Rags to riches. Everybody roots for the underdog, especially in the U.S., right? We, we love the underdog. That's a Rocky Balboa story. Okay, that's a rags to riches. That's also kind of a hero's journey, which isn't listed up here. Um, so the quest. The quest is another great one with, with any, of the, any of the Rocky series. I'm bringing this one up again. But really, any, any of the stories that ends up being a sequel, any of the movies that you see that are, are sequels, generally have some type of quest built into them. Think about the Lord of the Rings. They have to go on this long quest. That's a, that's a literal quest that they're going on. And they have little subplots that go on throughout the way. Um, so the voyage and the return. So think of this as kind of like the prodigal son. Somebody left, came back, okay? Um, it, it can be something that's uh, g going out in a blaze of glory or not. It doesn't really matter. But you're going on a journey, and then you come back to the place that you started from, right? Uh, taking pe somebody full circle. Comedy. Uh, I wish I could make everybody laugh, but it's just not one of my skill sets. All right? So, but if you can inject humor into your conversation, people are going to have more of an emotional response, and they're going to connect more with the story that you have. Now, you don't want to force it. Just use your personality and, and keep it in there, because by doing this, you're keeping everything very, very authentic, and by doing these stories in, in such a way that that it's your voice that's telling these stories, then what happens is the competition can't copy you. They can try and copy your story, but it's your story. And so they can't really go out there and try and do anything else with it. Um, the tragedy. You know, there's two parts to the tragedy, right? So you can have the tragedy, but you don't want to leave a story hanging on a, a very emotional low. So you're going to have to mix the tragedy in with something else, like the rebirth or rags to riches story. Uh, so you can bring, bring that customer emotion level back up so you can actually do some type of transaction with you. Uh, whether it's the, a transaction, and, and I mean this both in the financial sense or not, because you can get a transaction when somebody gives you their name or email address, right? Um, or phone number, or actually do fill out a credit card information and pay you for a product or service that you're doing. But to do that, you can't have them on a, on a really low emotional level because they'll never do it that way. Um, so then the last part is a rebirth, and this is like the story of the phoenix coming out of the ashes type of deal. Uh, there's going to be a, a good segue to that, of course, is the tragedy. So you have a tragedy, and then you have a re rebirth. But with any of these story archetypes, Hollywood does these really well. They mix and match these. So take a look at your favorite movies that are out there and try and pick out the story archetypes that are being used within, within the movie itself. Look, in, look in, your, in your everyday life for different story opportunities and see how you can frame them in such a way that you can actually come and use one, of, one or more of these story archetypes. Now, the, the last part of this, because I blew through this presentation, right, 
is that you want to get out there and start building a professional team to do this. So what happens is most likely you're not a typist that types 100 plus words a minute. So when you're getting that audio, when you're doing this audio, right, and talking this story out, you need somebody to be able to type that up for you. Transcriptionists, is what th that's what they do. Um, so there's, there's sites that allow you to go out there and, and hire transcription. A lot of them will do a per line or per, or per minute type of uh, transaction. And just so you know, um, and I didn't really touch on this before, when you look at 2,200 words, how that actually equates to about 15 minutes of talking, okay? So in this last half hour that I've been standing up here, uh, I've gone through three, 4,000 words, uh, probably more because I, I spoke a little faster. Uh, but when you start looking at it, the average person speaks between 125 and 150 words a minute. So now at the 15 minute mark, you're looking at somewhere between 2,000, 2,500 words. Now, whether you're doing that all at once or a couple little stories in between, doesn't really matter, okay? But so anyway, you get the transcriptionist over there to type it out for you. From the transcriptionist, it goes over to an editor. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why do you need an editor? You can edit yourself. You know, you, maybe you had great, great grades in, uh, in English class. I personally did not. Uh, but it always helps to have somebody else look at your work and look at your story because, uh, I mean, if you're anything like me, when I write something, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome, all right? But realistically, how I say it or how I speak it could be hard for somebody to understand. So maybe how I did the story, how I laid out the story should be reversed to make more sense for the person reading. Because even though it is a conversation and you're having that with yourself and speaking that, it might not come across the same way when it's in the written word. So having an editor reformat it for you. And that's the other part too, is they need to format it for you. When you look at stuff that's happening online, okay, and if you have these big blocks of paragraphs, it's very, very difficult. You don't want to do that. How many of you have gone to a blog before and you start scrolling and it's just one big chunk of, of words going all the way down? There's no, you know, they, they do this as a traditional way of reading, maybe a newspaper or a book, but online it's very, very difficult to read that way. Generally, you only want a couple lines, you know, three or four lines that keep this, uh, it, so it's easy to read. You start bullet pointing different things out. So it's easy to scan too, adding headlines in there. So a professional editor will go in there and, th and clean that up, and specifically for online, not necessarily uh, in the newspaper stuff, even though those people will have the same skill set to be able to do that. You want it formatted for online, which doesn't necessarily mean proper grammar. It doesn't mean necessarily mean that you're doing this uh, the way that they're gonna teach in school. Remember, it's the end user, your, your perfect client at the end, that needs to be able to easily read this and understand and then, con and then be able to connect with you. Um, so they format and edit, take another few minutes and have somebody do the search engine optimization on that. Because you're doing on-page optimization. So it really is to make sure that whatever your, the, the topic is that you're speaking about, it's gonna have the keyword, not the keyword density per se, but it just needs to have that keyword in there somewhere. Okay, uh, and, and maybe it needs, if you're using a keyword phrase and that keyword phrase should appear in there a couple different times. It's not gonna take a lot for the person who's doing the search engine optimization to go in there and tweak that just a little bit and still keep your voice as the author intact. Uh, and then they can go in there and fill out the things like the meta tags and description and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, they actually will link out to some uh, to other sites or other pages within your site, so you can get the biggest bang for your buck. Because you just spent, you know, you're, now you're spending money on it. So this is why I say for business blogging, because really, uh, if you're doing this kind of as a hobby, don't necessarily need to go go this route and have everybody do this, right? But if you're doing this as a business, this is a great big time saver for you. Uh, and then, part of the, what the SEO guy is going to do is kind of go out there and look for. Uh, an image for you, or you're gonna have a graphics person, which I didn't list on here, because a lot of times you can find free images that work really well in Creative Commons type of uh, situations. So Flickr for the Creative Commons is a really easy one to go out there and do. Uh, and there's another one that's called uh, Morg Files uh, that allows you to go in there and, and also look at uh, Creative Commons images, Morg Files, yeah like you're going down to the morgue for the funeral or whatever. 
just some more more files, right? Um, they allow for a Creative Commons. So you either need to buy the image and use it, and this is this comes to licensing terms, right? So you either want to buy the limit image so you have a licensing rights for that, or you want to go find something that's Creative Commons. And remember, because this is a business, you need to check that commercial use, all right? And so then you'll be able to do that. And that's that's the that's the easiest way to do this. Some of the pitfalls, I guess, on on some of this, you can use outsourcing uh, sites that are out there, and that's maybe a, a good way to to start off in doing this. Um, but you want you want to be conscious of a couple different things. One, you're the person editing your stuff, even if even if they have a long history as an editor, if it's not their native language it's gonna be difficult for them to do it in a way that will seem natural for your, com for, the, for your customer base. And it doesn't matter what language it is, if it's Spanish to English, English to Spanish. My mother is from Puerto Rico and I still laugh at her sometimes on some of the things that she says because they're either just backwards or she just says it just a little differently. Laugh at her in a good way, right? And, I, and she knows that and if she was here, I'd, she'd be chuckling at me too, all right? So that, that, that's what I'm saying, just watch who you're using. The other part is on, on the SEO side of the house, um, you just wanna make sure that they're using the white hat tactics. Are you guys familiar with like white hat and black hat tactics? Or you know, that's kind of a separate conversation, but you wanna make sure that they're not doing things like keyword stuffing. Uh, in the image tags, you can put all kinds of keyword stuff. It doesn't actually appear on, on, on the visible uh, side but that's something that Google frowns upon, putting a bunch of links all over the place on the bottom, pointing to different things that are also related to keywords, also not a good, a good idea. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing that's kind of in a nutshell. If you guys have specific questions, I'm here for the rest of the afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just want to say this. I've worked with Michael for three years. If you want to see the results of what he's talking about, I have a, a website you can go to. All my newsletters are For me personally, it's easy to use, and it comes out, you know, as a really nice deliverable. So, anyway, if you want to look and it. and believe it or not, this is the reason, one of the reasons I, I kind of came up with this system, because I was a couple of years ago, and I and I didn't pay him to say this, and I wish I would have. No, I'm just kidding, but um, I didn't pay him to say this. But a couple of years ago, when I, I started doing kind of a marketing plan with Joe. Getting him to write a blog post was like a sentence long, right? Because he's the hunt and peck typist guy. Very, it's very painful for him to do this, but he's also, in his field, he's very, very knowledgeable in what he's doing. So trying to transfer that knowledge from him to the blog was, was a painful process. Very, very painful process. Uh, and, but he's a, he's a storyteller. He's a natural storyteller. It's mercenarycoldcalling.com. And yeah, he, yes. I think you could talk a little bit more about the story arc of how you would incorporate them. Would you tell a story with a blog, or are you trying to think about where the audience is? Like, which story they would identify with, and kind of pull it from there? OK, that, that's a great question. So she, she wanted to know more about the story archetypes, right? So with the story archetypes, there, there's a couple different ways uh, that you want to do this. Uh, first of all, she was saying, do you want to talk and think about the story as where your, your customer is? You absolutely want to get inside the, the head of your customer when you're doing these and, and kind of think, what story about what I'm saying, how can I frame this so they can easily put themselves in that situation? So even if the story is about you, yourself, can you, can you tell it in such a way that your ideal customer is gonna be able to remove you from that story and put themselves in. With it within the blog post. Absolutely. So how many times have you seen a TV show or, or watched a movie and while you're sitting there watching it, you're putting yourself in that show. You're, you're like, oh, I wish I was this character. Or I wish I was this character, right? And that's kind of what you wanna do. It's gonna take practice, right? But the thing is, it, you're, you're starting with a point of a conversation that you're already used to having. So it's now it's just a matter of framing it just a little differently. You may not like the <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, yeah, so 
just as a perspective, I, I think that you know, if you're trying to sell a product or a service, you should really, and this is the approach that we take, even if it's simple as putting a PowerPoint up with who's your target market and what do they care about kind of stuff going on, right? So you know who you're talking to and you're reminded of what those people look like, right? If you're talking to moms with small children, get that picture up there with some of her stuff while you're thinking about that to craft the content. The other one is, I don't know where tools play in your segment, mm -hmm. but we use tools to track what's being spoken about too. Absolutely. Keywords go. Mm -hmm. So we're looking, you know, whether using Google Alerts or uh, another type of social media measurement, find stuff that's being spoke about and track it so that if an MSN article shows up that's getting a lot of hits and traffic, we're bringing that stuff together and use that with the linking and all of that. Stuff. Yeah, I didn't really talk about doing, uh, you know, coming up with creative ideas on, uh, on being able to talk about your product or service. But one of the things that you do, if you're, if you're looking about in your space, you're not going to be the only expert, okay? Um, not saying that you need to go out there and copy what everybody else is doing, but if you see something that is being talked about by a lot of the other experts, you need to take a look at it and say, hey, look, does, does my audience actually need to know that? Have I talked about it before? How could I reframe it and make myself stand out and be a little different than all the other conversations that are going on, all right? So you can take, uh, the, other, the other method that you can do is take something that somebody else has already done, add your two cents and make it a lot better. So if you see, uh, for example, uh, and, and this is one kind of dealing with numbers, uh, on, on, on the SEO side of space, there's a lot of ranking factors. And somebody put out a list a couple years ago that was like 100 ranking factors for SEO that Google uses. Well, they use over 200. So somebody else went back and said, hey, look, here's the 100, but here's all 212 that we found so far. Okay, so now they took what was somebody else was doing, then they completed the list, completed the thought, put in their own two cents, and now everybody's linking to that one. Everybody's referencing that one. So, it went, and, and that's kind of finding the gaps in the marketplace. If you have somebody that's out there telling a story, but it's not a complete story, finish the story for them. Finish the story with you and your product or service. Adding on to that, it's okay to leave a story unfinished to have other people do that same thing. Yes. Yes, it is. Especially if you're doing it in tandem with somebody, right? How much? Oh, that the one he's talking about is four hundred dollars a month. Yeah, uh, we have the whole team in place, and, and we're able to put it out pretty quickly. Have to, you have to tell the story. Well, we can. I mean, we can talk about that later. But it, it averages one post a week. Because when you're getting this length of time, as the business owner, you don't need to be blogging all the time. You need to be promoting your message, right? And that's that's kind of the other mistake that I that I see in the space. Is they spend all this time creating the content, but they don't actually tell the world about the content. If you spent more time, if you're spending 16 hours building this post. You should be spending just as much time or more promoting the post so other be people can know about it. So that whether that's reaching out to the bloggers or reaching out to your networking group, uh, you know, going to your chamber and telling people about it there, getting, getting eyeballs on that, whoever that target market is that, that you're trying to reach. So do you have uh, any recommendations as far as once you've written your posts and things like that, distribution tools and things like that, do you have perspective? Uh, not, not tools per se, but it, it really comes down to what the message is about, right? And it, obviously the first and easiest place to start is, is social media. If you've been building up the right following your audience, they should be able to take that and start disseminating and put that, putting that out. But you can also go to search uh, social media and take a look at who's, who's sharing similar topics of conversation that, that you just wrote about and reach out to them to see if I'd either they will share about it or link to you, okay? And it's generally a two-step process. You, you say, you, know, you, you kind of reach out to them and you say, hey, look, I noticed you shared something about this. I don't know if you're interested. I just wrote something and it's a little bit better or whatever, it, put your two cents in there. Um, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is saying, hey, look, uh, you wrote about this, kind of here's my two cents. Uh, it's, it goes a little bit more in depth. This is the response I'm getting, right, from maybe one of the people that's, uh, that they're talking about, right? And then you'll be able to do it that way. 
fact, I did that with a, with a blog post. I went through, and you'll, you'll, you guys will probably appreciate this. So I went through and I wrote this long blog post, right, th using this method. And then I, I specifically referenced an author that was in there. So I went on to Amazon, and I'm looking, I'm looking at the book, and I'm looking at the reviews that were on there. And as I'm going through the reviews, I noticed that there was a couple names that I kind of recognized as industry experts that were in the area, right? So I sent them a quick, a quick email, and I said, hey, look, I saw that you put a recommendation on Amazon about this book. I bought it, read it. Here's my two cents in the blog post. I'd love your feedback. Guess who went there? Yes, they went there. They put a blog post. E even the author of the book came by and, and put a comment on the blog post as well. Um, so it's, it depends on if you're going to do this on a small scale or if you're going to do this on a large scale, right? So what kind of tools you're going to use. Does that, does that kind of answer your question a little bit there? Yep. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns, revelations? Yeah, I mean, so, so that's that's the that's the kind of on the promotion side. Um, you go on there, and th one of the easiest places, obviously, is Facebook. A lot of people are on there. Some of your biggest audiences are going to be on there. Obviously, with one billion people, if you can't find your niche market on Facebook, you probably can't find it anywhere. But it's, I mean, it's not the end all be all. Uh, and and an example of that is if you were doing like motorcycles, Harley Davidsons uh, as an example, right? So Harley Davidsons, I don't even know how many how many Facebook fans they have there right now, but if you're trying to do an advertising campaign, you can do that. Or you can head over to the Harley, Le Harley Davidson social media site that has like 300,000 people and every single one of them is a Harley Davidson owner. So do you want to go into a spot that has a really small percentage of people that are your target audience or you want to move into a spot where everybody is your target audience? So just depends on what you're trying to do. Any other questions, guys? Hmm? All right. Thank you very much for your time.